I'm Monica Charette, and this is Holding the Light. As long as you love, I will. Suicide without warning is more common than we might think, which is why Annette McCoy will never stop asking herself, how did I not know? Sometimes, even after years of searching, the answers just aren't there. Instead of focusing on how her only child died, she is coming to terms with it by sharing her story and her endless love for Evan, turning that grief into so beautifully honoring her child. Today, Colby and I are holding the light with Annette McCoy. Annette, welcome to the podcast. It's such a pleasure to meet you and an honor that you are sharing your story with our listeners today. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, let me start by saying that losing a child is the worst strategy a parent can face. We both know that. But when it's your only child and the death is by suicide, it makes for a complicated grief. Would you describe your grief as complicated, Annette? I would, um, because I can compare it like to the loss of my parent or other family members that I've lost. I have lost one other family member to suicide as well. It was my brother-in-law, and that was very devastating, but nothing compares to the loss of my son. Yeah, nothing compares to that for sure. And you've described Evan as... Oh, as you told me, he's musical, he's so adventurous, um, highly intelligent, and also yes. highly introverted. Tell us about yes. that and about him as a young adult. Well, um, you know, growing up when he was real young, he wasn't as introverted. He joined, tried all the different sports, never really cared for team sports. He liked things more like Taekwondo, Boy Scouts, things that gave individual achievement. And he did do some things when he was younger with friends, like overnights and things, but really was more content to just be at home. Uh, and, you know, after he went through puberty, I would say that he got more introverted and he was really into like Minecraft and he went further than just playing Minecraft. He wanted to program it and he did what was called plugins. And he was just really into the logic behind that. And it was all self-taught. Um, he'd go online. He'd figure out how to do it. I'd say when he was, I don't know, 15 or 16, he did take a, a um, the intelligence test that you take, the IQ test. Yeah. And he tested at 140, which is pretty close to genius level. Wow. So I I feel like people that have intelligence like that tend to struggle emotionally and socially. Mm. It's like he was a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. He had always been someone that marched to the beat of his own drum, whether it made him look like an outsider to his peers or not. He was considered a nerd, which isn't a bad thing in schools now. Nerds have their own place. But um, I think he may have been a little intimidating to some of his schoolmates because of the intelligence. Um, and he just didn't, he was very quiet and I didn't really see that he was struggling though. I mean, I felt like he was confident in who he was. He didn't bow to peer pressure. He, like I said, marched to the beat of his own drum, but he seemed confident in doing that. So all through high school, you really didn't have any concerns. He didn't have any mental health issues that you were aware Not of. that I knew of. I mean, looking back on it, I have to keep saying not that I knew Right. But socially, he used to tell me he thought dating was stupid. It just distracted from what you're supposed to be focusing on. So he, again, he felt seemed confident in that decision. So he didn't date at all leading up. But when he was 16, he, he had his first and only girlfriend. So take us back at the time leading up to the day that Evan planned his suicide, if he did. He was 18, a freshman at the University of Maine. Yep. He was actually a sophomore. He, he entered as a sophomore. Oh, yep. wow. Okay. So was that transition hard for him when he left home and went to college? Uh, he was still living at home because he went to UMaine, and we're only 
probably 20 minutes from there. It was a very easy drive up the interstate. I live in Herman. So he was still living at home. He was dating his girlfriend when he started um, because they started while they were both dating while they were both in high school. So he did pretty quickly meet a group of friends there that were all engineering students like he was and really connected with them. And that's where I first really heard come out of his mouth. I really like being around people. And I said, you know, I said, well, that's good. You know, he's met these like-minded kids. Now, he did have a small group of friends from high school that were his gaming friends. And one of those friends put it this way to me after Evan passed that he needed that group of engineering friends in addition to them because talking to them was like talking to a rock. Because they recognized how intelligent he was. Right. And talking to them probably felt like talking to rocks. So he needed that group of engineering friends as well. So I thought it was all a good thing for him. They would meet and study together. He wanted to move up there because he felt like it took him too long to get there when they planned a gathering. He'd have to drive there. So he was planning on moving up there. Um, He passed in January of 2019, and him and his girlfriend broke up in December of 2018, Mm -hmm. mid-month, and that was devastating for him. Only girlfriend, um, he really loved her. She was two years younger than him, so, you know, young. It isn't meant to be forever when you're that young, you know. So he seemed to do okay with it. I did find messaging after that he was still working on her, trying to get her to go back. I hate to use the word begging, but kind of. To me, he seemed to be doing okay. But he was on break from college, so I knew he was really sad, and he was at home a lot during that break. So I was so relieved at the beginning of January when he went back to school. I actually think it was mid-January. And then he started studying with his friends again. And I thought everything was okay, but he had only been back to school for a week when this all happened. So um, the night before, he was up studying with his friends the night before. I did find out after that his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, was at that dinner. So I don't know what happened there. If anything... um, I talked to him that evening, um, asked him if he'd help us move some furniture the next night, said he would, he seemed fine. I was asleep when he came home. And when I got up to go to work the next morning, he was sleeping. I went in, reminded him he had a wool change schedule for his car that day. And he was sleeping, but he just murmured to me. And I gave him a kiss on the forehead, told him I loved him and left for work. And I think it was probably about 1.30, this was on a Tuesday, I uh, got a message from his girlfriend saying that he had sent her a video that he had videoed in our basement, in our family room in our basement. I don't, I never watched the video. The police recommended I didn't because they said it didn't usually, there's no use for it. It's, you know, just to have to see. Uh, And it wasn't the act. It was him videoing that it was saying goodbye. I don't know what he said beyond that. I can't live without you. This is what the police told me, pretty much, and I can't live without you video. So she sent me that about 1.30. And, um, of course, I was out of my office, so I didn't get it until an hour later. Uh, And so then I start frantically calling and calling and calling him, and I couldn't get a hold of him. Sorry. And my husband's job, he's out running around. So I called him and told him about the video and that I couldn't get a hold of him. And he said he'd come home and check on him. And I said, well, when you get to the house, text me as soon as you get there and let me know everything's okay. So then I don't hear from my husband and I don't hear and I don't hear and I'm calling him and he's not answering. And I called my my landline phone and I got a busy signal, which because you have call waiting, I kind of knew that when it's a busy signal, you're on the phone with 911. 
Oh. That's the. I think that's the only time you get a busy signal. Otherwise, it would ring yeah, as a call waiting. Didn't know that. I don't know that for sure, but yeah. I, I had heard that because that's the first thing I thought of. So I left work and I got in my car and I drove home. Um, and when I pulled onto our road, I could see the police cars at my house. And when I actually, before I pulled on the road, I saw an ambulance leaving our road. But still, you know, all, all the way home, I chanted, don't you dare, don't you dare. Oh, that must have been the longest ride home. How far are you from, was. from your home? I was working on 13th Street in Bangor. Um, it was probably 15 minutes. Mm. I uh, route two. And so when I come down the road, I saw the police cars in the yard and everything. And one of the policemen met me in the driveway and brought me in the house. And my husband was sitting on the bench right in the kitchen. And he jumped up and got in front of me. Uh, this had happened in our family room in our basement. Um, he was sitting in my spot, which he did a lot when I wasn't home. He had picked my spot and used my blankets. Um, him and I were really close. So I didn't go down. My husband didn't want me to. It, he did use, somehow he had gotten into our gun case. So he used my husband's firearm. Um, it wasn't a locked gun case. Although I will say Evan was an adult. He grew up target shooting. We really would not have kept those from him. We had no reason to, but they were in a locked gun case and he had to have gone in my purse to get the combination in my little book that I have in my purse. Mm. So he had to go through a lot of hoops to make that happen. Yep. I'm thinking about other parents listening to this, how terrifying it must be to hear that I had no idea this would happen to my child. And I can say that other parents in, in Herman, Evan grew up here right from pre-K right up until high school. So even though, you know, I mean, he was in this group of nerdy kids, um, they all knew each other and they all respected him. Um, like I said, I think a lot of them may have found him kind of intimidating, but he was well liked. And when he was a junior in high school, he actually came out of his shell. I think he consciously made a decision. I, I'm not gonna be like this anymore. And he auditioned for a play that he wanted to just do backstage tech. But when they auditioned, they make them run lines and they made them sing. And he ended up getting chosen for the lead in Bye Bye Birdie as Albert Peterson. Oh, wow. And who knew, like the principal said to me, who knew he could sing? I mean, my whole family's musical, but he sang like six songs in that play. And then he, he ran track, even though he was only mediocre at it. He did a show choir. He did one act. So his junior year really brought him out of his shell to get ready for that college experience, but it probably never felt natural to him. I think he had to make himself do it. And I'm sure this is a may seem an insensitive question, but I feel like we need to ask you, do you feel any responsibility for his passing because of the use of a firearm in your home? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know it's not reasonable. He was an adult. He had his own rifle. Uh, which was also locked in the cabinet, but we had never given him that combination. But I shouldn't have had it written there. You know what I mean? You can go through all of this in your head. Like, it's my fault because he got in my purse and found it. I shouldn't have had that where he could find it. But realistically, he would have done, he would have picked another method. Yeah. Well, realistically, you know, my daughter passed in a tragic accident, but I felt responsible for letting her go that night. So, I mean, that's what we do as parents. We're, it is. We're supposed and to you know, to it's, them. it's interesting because you go and talk to other family members and other people also take responsibility. Hmm. You know, my father, it should have been me hmm. because I'm old. My sister said to me, do you suppose he looked at me living by myself and didn't want that to be me? Interesting. Uh, just just all these different ways that people look at themselves and said, did I do something? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I find it 
really horrifying that his girlfriend, I'm sure, took a lot of blame onto herself for this, which she shouldn't do, because this there was something going on there a lot longer, you know, of for years before that. The catalyst, yes, but if it hadn't been that, it would have been something else. Yeah. Do um, you have a relationship with her now, or did you? At first, um, she came to his funeral, and she bought me a Mother's Day present that year. You know, he died in January, and she got me flowers and left him at my house in May. But I lost contact with her after that. I mean, she stopped responding to me, and it could have been for her own mental health reasons mm-hmm. that, that she just couldn't have me in her life. Um, So I have not talked to her since that year. And I reached out to her a few times and got no response. And I decided I needed to respect that. If she ever wants to talk to me, she can come talk to me and I would welcome her. But she needs to do what she needs to do for her own mental health. And so you think that Evan um, might have been uh, experiencing some, you know, emotional or mental distress prior to, uh, you know, the breakup and the the ensuing complications that resulted from that? You think maybe he'd probably experienced some of these symptoms in high school or earlier in college? I actually know he did because um, this is where I said finding answers. Um, I have, I found my way into all of his social media. I also found on his laptop, I found an essay he wrote when he was 16 and it cuts off right in the middle but he talks about his social struggles in this essay. I have no idea why he wrote it, Uh, but he talked about never feeling like he fit and how hard it was, you know, and this is when I found out that he really didn't think dating was stupid because he had his eye on a girl and he just didn't know how to, how to handle that. And he talked about himself. He said he knew all these kids at school looked at him as asexual And that um, when he did actually make a move and try to date this girl, the response that he got was, well, you know, Evan's Evan. So that essay was very telling. Um, I have shared it with a lot of my family members because it gives you a real insight into what he was feeling. And he was a really good writer. Mm. Everybody because it cut off right in the middle of a sentence and everybody wanted the end, you know, and I don't know, this was during the time he was in the play. So I would have suspected it to have a good end, but maybe not. Maybe he was struggling in spite of all that. I also read some of the messaging between him and his girlfriend and him and another friend. And this other friend was a male friend. And it's the only place I found him actually express his suicidal thoughts. I do not hold ill will about that either. This other person was a kid just like him, probably didn't want to break his confidence, probably didn't think he'd really meant it. In this messaging, it came to light that he also told this person that he got into our safe. Uh, That was probably less than a week before it happened. And he talked him down from that, said all the right things. And probably the next day, Evan acted fine. And he thought he was fine, that it was just that moment. But five days later, he took it out again. Maybe he took it out every night. I don't know. And he didn't contact anyone except her to send the video. I did find out from the police that he recorded that video 12 days before he actually did it. It wasn't that day. Wow. So he had been thinking about it. I think on on January 4th, he made a comment to that friend that if he could get in the safe, he probably wouldn't be here anymore. On January 24th, he got into the safe. Um, And then he died on the 29th. So I suspect he sat there with it a few times. What do you do with all of this? I just can't imagine how you begin to process what just took place and how you help yourself in the next weeks and months ahead. Did you go to therapy? Did your did your husband did how did, how was that 
okay, right, right after, I mean, that day, my, you know, this is what my thoughts did. I mean, it's disbelief, of course. Mm. Um, and of course, what my husband saw, it's a whole different story for him because he's the one that found him. He never touched him or anything, but he, he's the one that found him. So a whole different story, you know, well, I shouldn't say a whole different story, but a definitely a different story. Mm, his story, which is very different. Yeah. So, but right after I just kept saying, and ch it was almost chanting, what the heck, Evan, what the heck? I didn't use the word heck, but <laughs> we're <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. So I just kept saying that over and over. And I don't know if this was true for you when you lost your daughter, but your mind keeps trying to turn back time and make it different. Mm -hmm. I kept feeling like I'd keep having these moments where I felt like I could fix it. I wanted to fix it. So that's like immediately after. Um, in the weeks after, I didn't stay out of work very long. And I know it surprised people, but I would have gone insane. After we got past the service and everything, I would sit on my sofa and just rock back and forth. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't read. I couldn't watch TV. Everything. I felt guilty about everything. We were afraid to be in our house alone. So my husband and I would meet at the railroad tracks when we get out of work to get home at the same time. Uh, my laundry areas down in the basement, we would go down and fear right to the right to the laundry room. We didn't dare to go in the room. Um, it's a weird fear. Mm. I was so afraid of losing everyone else. I had to sleep with my hand on my husband every night. Um, of course, we've gotten over all that, but yeah, that went on for weeks and weeks. Um, you just, it just makes you feel like you're going to lose everyone. And I was so afraid of him disappearing, like he never existed. Yeah, that must have been especially hard. I'm really happy to hear, though, that you came together in your grief and not separating because your grief is very different. Yeah. And we, that's, that's a big thing is we have allowed each other to grieve our own way. One person may cry more than the other. One person may talk about it more than the other. As far as therapy, I have a lot of sisters and my dad, I think I told you on the phone that my dad was someone that really stepped up and was willing to talk it and talk it. And I could, I mean, I could tell him all the details and he would talk it with me and That's he was really good like that. So I, I never went to therapy because I had them and they were all willing to listen and wanted to hear the horrible details. Uh, my husband did, isn't really a talker. He's more withdrawn. And I don't know if, you know, I mean, that's more common for men that they don't show those feelings. And, you know, because of course I could cry and show my real feelings in front of everyone. So he did go to a therapist. We chose not to do couples or group therapy, but he did go to a therapist for a while. And they tried to help him with um, some method they used to try to get him to revert his mind whenever he got that picture in his head. He went there for a while, and I think it helped him. But you chose not to. I chose not to. I had my my sisters and, and my mom and my dad, and everyone was... And, and my friends, too. And I got very comfortable with just crying my eyes out in front of people. And they could either leave the room or stay and wait through it to talk about it. So so the stigma associated with suicide in our society makes some families really reluctant to talk openly about this. And to me, that would cause even deeper grief. If I couldn't talk openly about Cassidy and say her name... And celebrate her life, I'm sure, as, as you have, but um, it's part of my healing and my own survival. And I, what do you want to say to share your story? Like, why, why did you want to come forth and, and share the, how he died? Well, I mean, right from day one, I had people say, you know, do you want me to, you know, not, not say how he died? And it's like, absolutely not. That I said, it's not a dirty little secret. Right from day one, this is not a dirty little secret. You're looking at a boy who had everything going for him. He was smart. He was going towards a great career. You know, he had done some dating. I mean, 
everyone was shocked. And I know that the other parents in the school district were horrified to think that this could happen to me. I think it really opened everybody's eyes to this could happen to any one of us because he would have been one of the last people people would have expected to do this. So I want to talk about it and I want people to understand that it's not just people who are on hard times. In Evan's own words, in the essay he wrote, or no, actually it was in one of the messages that he said to this boy that he was talking to, I don't have all those struggles, so why do I feel like this? He didn't have any life struggles. So it, it isn't about that. It's, it's a disease like any other disease. Um, and people need to understand that and try to help people ask for help. Yeah, we've shared sometimes that people say just the most inappropriate things to you. Yes, they do. When you're grieving. So what do you wish others not walking this path understood about the grief journey? That there is no right or wrong way to grieve someone. Some people need to, this would be me, keep things as a memorial. Evan's room still is Evan's room. Everything is the way it was. And some people think that's unhealthy. Well, it's not if it's comforting to, comforting to me. But some people need to just get rid of everything. You know, because they, they can't have those memories around. That's also okay. It's whatever you want to do, and there's no time limit on it. You don't ever stop grieving. You just learn how to carry it. My life will never be the same, and I'm not the same person that I was. There is a sadness in me that didn't exist before this that will never go away. Um, that doesn't mean that I haven't moved forward and that I can still laugh and have good moments. And in my head, I'm sharing those with Evan, and I know that he would enjoy that because him and I enjoyed goofiness together. And that's what he, I know, loved most about me. So I just know that he's with me in my heart and my head when I do those things. And I think about him every single day, you know, because that's another thing when people that have not experienced anything like this, you know, they think, well, it's been four years, four and a half years. You know, you should have moved on by now. It's like, you don't ever move on. And those are people that just haven't experienced this. Yes. Yeah. What have you learned about your own grief process in the last four years? I thought that I would, you know, having a loss like this would have made me curl up in a ball and not be able to function. And maybe that did happen at first. But I have found that I'm funneling it into doing things in his honor that hopefully will help other people. The year that he passed, we did the uh, AFSP, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Walk, the Out of the Darkness Walk. And we did it up big. We got all kinds of Evan bling and we passed out shirts with his picture and his dates on it. And we all walked as a group and we had 100 plus people on our team that year and we raised over seven thousand dollars for suicide prevention and we continue to do that every year of course and we knew it each year the group gets a little smaller because people move on but our core group is at least 30 people so we still have a good sized team um, we do that every fall and then in 2020 we decided to start up a rock project um, and we paint inspirational rocks. Um, we started a Facebook page called Evans Rocks Around the World. And the, the rocks are all different designs. Um, my husband paints most of them because I've started doing the crocheting. But my husband paints most of the rocks and I do some. And we put the Facebook page on the back and we give them away for people to take on trips and put different places. And they have, you know, choose to stay, you matter, those kind of sayings on them. And they've gone all over the country. Some of them have gone out of the country. Um, our most recent was in Saigon, Vietnam. Buckingham Palace, the Eiffel Tower, uh, Spain, Portugal. Most of them are in the United States, but they've gone all over the place. I, you know, we try to do big painting and we've got wood. 
planning to do another big painting and, you know, do a restart um, to get a whole bunch of new rocks out. Um, so we started that in 2020, and that's been going a couple of years, and the page has over 600 people on it. So anybody can join the page, by the way, because I'm a member of your page now. and I've, Yeah, yeah I've it will tell it. you that you have to be accepted, but I accept everyone Beautiful. unless they post something irrelevant on the page, and then I, I remove them <laughs> if they start posting irrelevant things. But um, if you go look through, um, all the rocks are there, but I post a lot of quote, quotes and things that I see that are relevant to mental illness and suicide. So I, so I try to post um, things that will help other people. So we've got that. And then in January of 2022, I started crocheting different things. I started out with some pods that you could put plants in or flower arrangements or whatever. And I made these little plant kits to plant your own wildflowers and had a little shovel and everything. And I went to a local uh, store and they were willing to take me on consignment. So I started selling that thing, those things in the store. And now I make stuffed animals and I make all kinds of different things. And I sell them in that store. I'm just about to start selling in a second store. And we also do all kinds of craft fairs. And all the proceeds from that go to a scholarship to a graduating senior at Herman High School every year. Um, we do $2,000 a year for that scholarship. Um, and we, we are choosing the field of computer engineering or mechanical engineering because there really aren't that many scholarships out there for those fields, surprisingly. So um, we choose someone that's going into the engineering field like Evan was. So you really found ways to channel all this yes. sadness, the grief, into yes. something that's really meaningful for you and your yes. family. Yeah, and all of those things, you know, we, we all three of those things we, we will continue to do. And yes, it gives us something to focus on. So Evan was your only child. And I've yes. shared in an earlier podcast that I just can't imagine what that grief is like. Because as you see, Colby, on our screen right now. Um, he provides me with so much love and support and purpose. And I just want to ask you, how does it feel for you? And what gives you purpose? I mean, mostly what I just talked about, those, you know, honoring him by continuing all these things and trying to help other people. Losing an only child means no wedding, no grandchildren, because he was too young, you know, he hadn't gotten there yet. So no grandchildren. Um, no one to leave our legacy to. It just a lot of future things that we looked forward to are not going to happen. That must be really hard. It is very hard. We like to close our podcast by giving our guests the opportunity to share how they would like us to remember their child. And I want you to be able to do that as well. Um, you've done a beautiful job of that already in our conversation. But you also have something special that you want to read and share with us. I do. I do. Um, Evan was a very quirky, funny person. He was very, you know, his personality was very different because he was so reserved, yet not many people got to see the real Evan. Um, if you go, and I don't know if you watched any of the videos on I did. the page. He has a big did personality. You I love yeah. it. Yeah. Did you watch the run video? I did. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> You know, you can see him, but not everyone got to see that. And that's who he really was, is that. So this poem is written by the young lady that played the lead in the play with Evan. They never dated. Um, apparently, she had an unspoken love for him. Um, she still messages him to this day on his Facebook Messenger. Sure, she knows I read all of them because she'd be able to tell. Oh, sweet um, but girl. yeah, at least once a month she messages and talks to him, and that's probably her how she handles her own grief. Um, but she wrote this poem for him and gave it to me after his service, and this describes him in a, a very unique way, and I, I absolutely love it. I've read it at a couple other suicide events, and she just titled it "A Poem for Evan." As a tree grows taller, it tapers away, turning from roots to branches. And those branches have branches, and those branches have twigs, with leaves falling as the tree dances. I remember when you were just a root, a root so strong it was unfair. 
I knew your roots were stronger than mine, but I didn't like to compare. There was a moment I remember well, your branches began to grow. And with strong interest, I took a step closer, for you were a tree I needed to know. As more branches grew, I decided to climb, although frightened that you'd break. But you held me up and continued to grow, a unique friendship we would make. Your bark didn't feel like other trees, but still, you wore it with pride. And when the wind blew, you stayed up straight, while other trees swayed side to side. In a forest filled with lookalikes, you stood up tall and rare. Your leaves were red, a fiery red, so bright I had to stare. While other trees liked to be trimmed, you stayed true to how you grew. Perhaps you became too frustrated with this forest that you knew. So you'd tapered off from roots to branches to twigs to leaves so bright. And by this time, I'd been blessed enough to have experienced your light. I guess one moment the wind blew fiercely and your roots came out of place and your branches battled against the forest, swinging all around the space. Storms are natural, they come and go, we will never understand why. But your leaves were just so beautiful, so still we wonder and try. No one will think weak of you, some storms no plant can stand. I'm so sorry you had to be there, to be hit with it firsthand. But when the wind hit and your leaves blew, they did not disappear in the air. They'll soar high and far, and wherever they land, I'm hoping that I'll be there. That is so beautiful. I'm trying to get myself back together for this. <sighs> I, I cry every time I read it. <laughs> I can imagine. I really appreciate your candidness and, that, and the way you have turned tragedy to such purpose in helping others. And I thank you for sharing Evan's life and your grief journey, and the hope that we can all walk beside our grief. Yes. Thank you for having me. It's therapeutic to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. As long as you love. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast helpful, please share our link with others and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. I'm Monica Charette reminding you that you are never alone in your grief. Until next time, we'll be right here with you, holding the light. As long as you